Okay? Try to do this informally. First of all, can you tell us about where you were born and who your parents were? I was born in San Pedro, and uh, my mother was Maria Teofila Ortiz Lujan, and my father was Pedro Jose Lujan. Did you go to school in the Española Valley before did you yes. start school? Yes, I went to a school with the nuns in Santa Cruz in the first grade. And um, my mother, who had worked all her life, she was a school teacher and she was out in the workforce during the time that generally most women were at home. But anyway, she was working and I had the opportunity to go to school at Loretto in Santa Fe with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Alvidres and their daughter Lucy. They wanted a companion for her because uh, originally she didn't speak any English. So I went to Santa Fe and I went to Loretto. We both uh, went to Loretto and Mr. Alvidres was working in Los Alamos. Who did Mr. Alvidres work for? Who was that? Mr. Alvidres, who did he work for? I believe he worked for AC. He was a carpenter. Okay. And you know, in 41 and 42, there was so much, go so much building going on up here. And he had the opportunity to get housing. So they decided to move to Los Alamos. And at that time, uh, they asked my mom and dad if I could go with them to Los Alamos. But even then, there was some type of a secrecy. They, they claimed that the camp was going to be closed or frozen, as they called it. Nobody could go in or go out. And my father and mother said, well, she can stay up there as long as that doesn't happen. But should that happen, she would have to come home. Uh, what grade? What grade were you? In? By that time, I was in the third grade, okay. and I believe it was during the mid part of the third grade. The army was up here. I can still remember we had, we were living in in a fourplex. It was a two-story building right close to the main. Uh, drag, what they call the main drag there. I don't remember the name of the street. On this picture, can, do, you, do you find your residence where you were living? Um, now it, let me see. This being Trinity and then... Trinity Sites? And Central would have been... Yeah, uh, that's right what... Central would have been here. Okay. We lived in one of these, what they called... Uh, it was an apartment house, kind of a... a um, How do, far from the lodge was the apartment house? Um, at that time, I don't know, I'm terrible with... With Central with, School being over here. Oh, yeah. yeah, the school. Yeah, well, we used to walk to school from the area, so we must have been in this area here. I don't remember any the water tanks there. In the hospital, this is more towards uh, uh, what was the sites, wasn't it, where the hospital is? Yes, this uh, right? was the technical area. Yes, yeah. right. Well, we weren't in that area at all. Maybe it was Trinity Avenue then, where there was a two-story fourplex similar to... What did it feel sound like this? Mm, no, that, it, it would look more... It these are dorms, yes. I realize. And I remember that at the um, military, would march early in the morning, um, you know, singing or doing the whatever it is, the caissons or whatever, early in the morning. It was very impressive for a child my age to see something like this. You know, Española was the hubbub of nothing but the Spanish people, so this was quite an interesting thing. But anyway, I went to school to grade school 
and I, I went with uh, some of the foreign, there was this one particular boy that um, I don't know if he was Russian or what he was. Um, and I believe his name was Ronald. I can't remember his last name, but his name was Ronald and he was quite the bookworm and quite, uh, he was quiet, not a mingler. Was he a son of a scientist? Yes, okay. very intelligent. He was a very intelligent boy and he stayed during recess while we were out playing ball. He would stay in the class and read books and uh, very nice. And one thing that really struck me that was really strange, in the fifth or the sixth grade, I'm not quite sure which one it was, this gentleman came in and proceeded to tell us about the atom bomb. And you know, everything was secret in Los Alamos, in Española. Uh, no one knew what was going on, and he proceeded to tell us about the makeup of the bomb. And I can't imagine why he would be doing this, because we're children, we're young children, and our technical view of what was going on was, I mean, it was something that was, would not have been imagined, I would think. I know for myself it wasn't. And he proceeded to go to the blackboard and draw these little circles and tell us that these were atoms or nuclear or whatever. And when they collided, they would explode and develop more so that the chain reaction that was happening could cause a tremendous explosion. And to this day, I still don't know. After the atom bomb was dropped, you know, I, that was probably what, in 45? Um, by that time I was, what? I was born in 33. So the, con the connection there was never there before. And I can't imagine why this gentleman had gone into our room to tell us that. And the opportunities that we had were far beyond anything that I had seen going to, uh, you know, to school with the nuns, first in Santa Cruz and then in Santa Fe. We had activities um, that went beyond reading, writing, and arithmetic. I remember they used to bus us to a lake outside where the sites were. There was a pond, a frozen pond, and during the winter time, they'd take us ice skating there. And this was just such a tremendous outlook on life, having lived in San Pedro with the Spanish people uh, all my life. It was an education in itself. It was a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and I was there through um, the sixth grade, and then I went back to Espanola and went to school there. Do you going remember back... some of the teachers at the Salamos, their names? Oh, yes. Who were I... your teachers at the Salamos? I can't remember the name, but there was this one young lady that left the most lasting impression on my, on my mind. We used to have spelling bees. And one of the things that I think was hard for me was English. Even though my mother had spoken English to us, she had learned in Loreto prior to that, and my dad spoke only Spanish, and we had to answer in Spanish, but I was bilingual. But the language itself, when this teacher, and I was told that she was a sergeant in the army, she was quite firm, but she taught us the English language by diagramming. And I found that extremely fascinating, so that it, it really helped me to cement the adverbs, the adjectives, and everything that went on. And it, it really helped me a lot. And I still remember her. I could see her, even though she was, like I say, very strict 
and very businesslike. Do you remember the name? I can't no, think no. of her name. But I, she was a sergeant, you see. She, that's what the rumors were, that she was a star, sergeant and that, you know, she ran the class like a military. And the, and the school, at that time, the Army was there. Another thing that I remember was that when we were in the classroom, there would be the nurse that would come in weekly in order to call various names because they were going to give us a shot. We were immunized endlessly, it seemed like. And this one time, one of the classmates, it was a boy, he was kind of a slight fellow, ran into the bathroom and he would not come out throughout the whole day because of the immunization. And I don't know how many different shots they gave us. They would ask you if you were right-handed or left-handed and ended up giving you two in one and one in the other so that it seemed like, you know, we must have been, I guess they didn't want to ca have anybody carrying any germs or anything. I don't know. I, we had never gotten shots. I think the nuns used to give us castor oil but that was the extent of, of anything like that. I went to uh, Loretto, um, and I was a boarder there for the, the sixth grade. No, this was, no, I went to Española. I went to school there on the 7th, 8th, and 9th, and the 10th through the 12th, I was a boarder at uh, Loretto Academy with the nuns. I had taken a test with the merit system exam, a state test, and I had tested rather well, and they, they had offered me various jobs through the merit system exam, but I wanted to work up in Los Alamos, so I took an exam, and I went to work up there in 51. What group did you work for? Did you work uh, for the lab or the AEC? Did you work for the AEC or for the lab? Or for no, the I worked for Lassell. Lassell. What, mm -hmm. what group? I worked for Lassell. I was in uh, supply and property. I still remember the names of the individuals who were in charge of that group. There was Harry Allen, yeah. who was the biggest boss, and Mr. Van Gemmert was his assistant. And my immediate supervisor was Mr. Dubberley. This was in 51. And we worked in P Prime. There was a two-story uh, building close by the pond. Close by the pond, yes. I, this is, of course, runs to P Prime. Uh-huh. And that's where you work for Supply That's Robert. exactly. Now, uh, well, you, at one point or another, you babysat for some of the scientists at Los Yes. Can you tell yes. us about that in your own words? Right. That must have been an experience. Well, my mother, by this time, was working, I don't remember when she started, but she was working in the lodge. And in the beginning, I remember that there were many men that lived in the lodge. That was, Fuller Lodge was the only big building that they had prior to the government taking over. And there were also some log cabins. I don't know if there were about five or six log cabins adjacent to the lodge. And that's where the families were. Anyone who had children, they called it bath, bathtub row, I believe, which was just surrounding on the outside of the lodge. Right here, Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, my mother was asked to babysit with some of these scientists' children. One of them was uh, Dr. Tellers, and there was a boy by the name of Paul, and a young girl, she was still a baby, by the name of Wendy. And I got to babysit with them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the boy was extremely smart. I would say he was probably maybe eight, nine years old. And he was reading Newsweek and things like that, that I was 18. And I had no interest in something like that. But he would read these articles, and I take it that, you know, the influence of his father, Mr. Tiller. And I ran into Mr. Tiller one time in uh, Los Angeles at the airport, and I went up and introduced myself and told him, asked him if he remembered my mother. And he said, oh, you mean Maria? Because in Española, she was called Teofila. But here at the lodge, a lot of these people, I guess, didn't know how to pronounce her name, so they would call her Maria. And I was very, very fortunate in that. Another one that I got to babysit was also... Now, what were your impressions of Dr. Teller? Was he very cordial in the house? He, very studious, very... Um, he was not a conversationalist. Mm -hmm. He was always, you know, his mind, you could tell, was always somewhere else. The same way as the rest of the scientists that walk through P-prime, mm -hmm. a lot of them with their hands in their pockets and their head down and thinking there, there was not a sociability type of thing, you know, like we were used to in the valley with everybody knowing everybody. Uh, these were people that were just within themselves. You could tell that they were basically thinkers, and I guess they never quit. Um, what so about Mrs. Teller? His wife? His wife was very much a homebody. She, she wasn't a society lady. She was a mother. And I, I imagine that during the time that we babysat, they must have gone to social occasions. I heard her speaking in her language to Dr. Teller, but I don't think that, you know, that I can say that I ever really carried on a conversation with her. Mr. Teller was the one, or Dr. Teller was the one that would say, well, we're going to be gone at such and such a time and we'll be back at such and such a time and you know I was to feed the children and and do whatever was necessary through the evening uh, and the next scientist that I babysat for was Dr. Ulam. he had an only child by the name of Claire and she was born in 44 so uh, she was 11 years younger than I was. So when I was 18, she obviously was around seven years old. And I remember that she would pump both my mother and I in regard to stories like Christmas, like the birth of Jesus. And I take it that, you know, she, I don't know if, her parents were atheists uh, and didn't believe in that. But I, I take it that she was so fascinated that she was constantly, whenever we would babysit, she would tell us, well, tell, us, tell me some stories about this and that and the other. And I often wonder about her, uh, you know, where she's at, what she's doing. Um, I know that uh, I've checked into the internet, and um, both Wendy and Paul were listed as survivors when uh, Dr. Teller died in, uh, what was it? He was 95 years old in, I forget what year it was, but he lived quite a long time. And I often wonder what they are doing, but I understand that uh, Paul has a doctor's in front of him, but I don't know if he's a medical doctor or whether maybe he continued as a physicist or, or what in California. I'm sure he's in California or that they probably are in California. And uh, 
Claire, uh, another person that I babysat with was um, Robert McKees. He had a, a, an infant child. He was the contractor, the main contractor in, in Los Alamos. And they lived there in the lodge. I don't know for what length of time. This was, I'm sure, before there was any housing. So for all I know, um, you know, this was a temporary thing. And now his, his wife was very social. Sometimes I would babysit for a whole day because she was out for breakfast or bridge or lunch. And then uh, he would come home and they were out for cocktails and dinner. So <laughs> I babysat with uh, the little boy f for Do quite a while on weekends. The he, um, I can't remember. He was an infant. And I don't remember if he was also Robert or not. I may be confusing that with her, with the father. But uh, it was, ex it's an experience that apparently I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, something that has enriched my life tremendously because I don't think that, um, you know, that's an opportunity that too many people have to see all the history and everything that was going on later on, it, it was terribly fascinating for me. Do you remember any, anything happening after the Trinity test? With the Trinity? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. done by Socorro. Uh, tested the bomb. Were you aware of anything that went No, no. no. In supply and property, basically what we were in charge of was the materials, and we had, um, at first I was working for Eddie Wartman, and there was the ordering, and I guess of the placing, and also of the storing. And then later on I was given an office where I took care of a lot of these files in regard to this. But as far as having any connection with the bomb, um, Very remote. I, I don't know. I knew that there was a site and I also knew in the area that we lived, there was a canyon. And there were rumors that there were deposits, you know, in the back of this canyon. And I don't know whether that's true or not. I guess since Lucy and I were both girls, we didn't venture out in that area. But um, like I say, it, it was a tremendous experience for me. I, I can't imagine. Um, you can't imagine how rewarding it was that now I see that part of history and to think that I was there in the very beginning, you know, when they were building and they were doing all of that. It basically was so different because, like I say, my uncle, who was the main gardener, Adolfo Montoya, he was married to my dad's sister, had lived up there and they had uh, property they had their own log cabin, you know, uh, Lucia and the Montoyas. And we, I remember visiting and it, to me that was like a haven with all the greenery and it was a little scary coming up that hill because it was like a one narrow road and if somebody was coming down, you had to sit on the side and let the individual go by. So that was kind of a frightening thing to come up on that hill. Uh, of course, later on, they had improved it tremendously. Do you remember what happened after the end of the war? Did any people were able to talk more about what they had done at Los Alamos? Um, was well, a lot of by celebration, a lot of happiness? Uh, were, you, were you at Los Alamos when the war ended? Uh, you know where we, my mother and I, we were in California at the time that the war ended. And what I remember was seeing all the ticker tape that was coming down from the high buildings. And of course, 
like I say, things never really registered as whatever. My, my brothers and my sister were nine to 11 years older than I was. And my brother, Eddie, was in the military. And they had just missed the impact that Los Alamos had on the valley was tremendous because there was no money prior to that. And there was basically no education. So if you stayed in the valley, you were either a farmer's wife or a farmer. And my brother chose to go to California and so did my sister. Uh, one of them graduated, I believe, in 40 and the other one in 41 or 39 and 40, right before Los Alamos started. So they went to California and you know, they just missed that era of Los Alamos coming in to where the people in the valley were able to send their children to get a further education. Otherwise, there was no money. It was a matter of living, uh, you know, with the harvest, selling whatever you had during harvest. Uh, there was a, the one store which was Bon and All. My mother, who was very independent, like I say, was one of two women who worked there. And I believe that the reason that she was there, because women were not employed and the men were basically the ones that came to the store. So they didn't want a woman working with them. But because most of the men spoke only Spanish and my mother could speak both English and Spanish, she was more or less of an interpreter in regard to the, the owners and the people there. There was a lady by the name of Mrs. Haney who lived and she was an accountant, but my mother was actually um, a floor clerk. And she says she remembers that um, some men would come in and she would say, well, can I help you, you know, in Spanish? And they would say, oh, well, I'm waiting for Don Elias, who happened to be even a relative of ours. Uh, so even in those days, you know, it was, it was a different time. And my mother was way ahead of her time. She, she was a teacher. used her bilingual uh, yes. Uh, bilingualism to work both in the valley and then later at Los Alamos. Mm. She was the matron at the lodge for... Yes. She was what they called a housekeeper. She was there during the time that uh, the army was there. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Barker, I think, were the ones that were in charge of the lodge at that time. I don't know. I think that's you, what Mr. Samora mentioned, that some lady by the name of Barker was in charge. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But she was a housekeeper there. The main cook was uh, Marky. Oh, okay. That name has come up a lot. Yeah. He was the main cook there. And I looked, but I couldn't find. I, um, I have a picture that came out in the newspaper regarding the celebration when my mother retired. I don't remember how many years, but she was 70 years old. And I think at that time, the retirement age was 65, but she was very young for her age. And she lived four months short of 100. And she lived basically uh, the last 29 years of her life in our home in Albuquerque. After you worked at Los Alamos, obviously, you went on to other things. And what are your big interests now? Well, I, I um, graduated in 51, worked through 54, and then I married uh, Jovi Hill. We've been married uh, 54 years already. And when we were in Albuquerque, this friend of ours had set up traditions in order to retain and preserve the arts of the Spaniards and the Indian arts. And he asked me to do a presentation or a workshop 
in regard to culture. And my mother and 11 other women had chartered the Arte Antiguo that was a club back in 1928. This was even before I was born in order to try to preserve the culture. By 1930, when the Depression was on, uh, the WPA was coming into New Mexico to try to help the people generate money back into the state so that he, the government informed the state that they were to teach the people, the old traditions, the making of furniture, colcha, which was part of, of the arts, uh, tin work, and anything that they had done during the early years. Uh, in 1598, when the uh, Spaniards had come. And since my mother had gotten together with a group of 11 other women, they used to meet every month in each other's home. Well, by 1930, when the government had gotten into this, they decided to do culture monthly as part of the preservation of this art. And she and Mrs. Kata, who was actually, uh, do you know Libby Kata? I know the girl. Uh, I forget what her married name is. Anyway, Mrs. Kata was a very, very good friend of my mother's. She had come, as I understand, she had come with her family and they were on their way to California when they were uh, retained in San Juan because I don't know if something broke down or what it was. But anyway, Mrs. Kata was about 15 years old, and they were there for about two years before they went on to California. And by that time, she was getting married to Mr. Kata. So she was uh, left there, and I understand her father used to come about every two years. You know, traveling in those days was something that was very hazardous. but. She adopted all the Indian ways, and she even has um, displays in the Smithsonian. She would make uh, dolls with the garb of the Indians, and she also taught the whole Pueblo how to redo the pottery that their ancestors had done, because obviously, obviously between you know, the 1600s and the 1900s, early 1900s, a lot of that was lost. For one thing, culture that is originally, I believe, probably started in the 1600s because of a need that our ancestors had in order to create some warmth for their bedding. They had you know, nothing, but they had the churro sheep that they had brought. And there was always the question with the curators and with everybody as to why was it that they used just one stitch? Why didn't they use various stitches? And I believe that the reason that they did was because when they use a couching stitch, which eventually became known as colcha, which actually means a bedspread or some kind of a spread, it, they create three widths of wool because they made their savania from the wool of the churro sheep. With that, they would weave it, and then they would take some of the same yarn, which was wool, and they would dye it with natural pigment, and they would embroider on it in order to not only embellish the spread, but also to give it more wool. Because in culture, you overlay another length of wool and you come down through the savania and you go up and anchor it, 
causing three widths of wool, which naturally would give you the warmth that they were so badly in need of. And this is something that had never been written. And when I went to traditions to do this workshop, I found that nobody knew what I was doing. So Colcha was a dying art. And my mother, um, it was in our home forever as far as I was concerned, and I thought it was just a household word, you know, something that everybody did. So when I did this display and found that there were, there was no one that knew what was going on, I decided the next year when I went that I would have an inventory to show more people. Well, the second year came around and I had some culture done with some tin work and people would stop and admire it, but they still didn't know what it was. There was one couple and they weren't even Spanish and they stopped and he said, the gentleman said to me, oh, you're doing colcha. And I looked at him and I said, how do you know? <laughs> because I had not experienced any recognition prior to that. And he said, oh, my wife and I are docents at Las Colondrinas, which naturally explained the whole situation. So you not only knew the culture stitch, but you've gone on to write two books about culture. Right. Well, when I found out, I was bound and determined that I was going to try to not only teach, but write a book of what I knew because I had grown up with it. And I know that once that I'm gone, my children won't be able to do that because they were all born in the city and they don't know, you know, they have not experienced the beauty of, of what I have seen. So I, I went to a neighbor of mine who had written an article on um, the um, uh, culture for my mother and she, had, she was a freelance writer and she had sold it to the Denver Post. And this was in 1980. And I went to her and I said, we need to write a book in regard to culture. I said, I believe that I know things from experience and I gather, because I remember getting up when I was little and you know, we had pop belly stoves and my dad would put in coal and wood in there. And in the morning, those floors were freezing. And they were, they had an anoleum, you know, they weren't dirt, dirt floors, which I imagine our ancestors had. So that I know that that was a need that they had for culture. And it did die after there was no need when the commercial, you know, the train came and the people through the St. Saint, uh, Saint Louis and that there, they went all the way to uh, Chihuahua, that the commerce, there was a lot of trade and everything, the, the cotton. I imagine that it slowly was dying because there were things available to the people for those that had money uh, that were buying instead of going through the old ritual. And I believe that's one of the reasons. It's even hard now to find wool because it's it's supply and demand, and there's no demand out there. People are not doing it. Nobody wants to do this. There's approximately 40 to 50 stitches in a square inch that I have. And in this book, you can see some of my work. It, some of it is done with tin work around it. And uh, there's also a Sagrada Familia which is part of our tradition from Santa Cruz because of, of Father. Salvador. Yes, and he was the one that married my mother and father in 1920. He also married Joe and I in 1954. So that was a long history that he had. And I was, I was just amazed when my mother passed away, she was buried here in Santa Cruz and I was so amazed to see all the holy families that were on the altar. Because I can remember as a child 
that the Holy Family used to come to our home on the fifth of every month. And I don't know if your family belongs to that or not, but you know, the moment that it entered the home, there was a candle lit and that stayed on for the rest of the day. Prayers were said in the evening, the doors were closed and on it went to the next, to the next family. So these are part of traditions and the beauty of, of what I was able to experience as a child. And I felt that all this knowledge was something that, that I had to put into a book. So when we started writing this book that I did my research and Willie had a lot to do with helping us retrieve uh, pictures, you know, like from the altar. I had done the altar piece. My mother was supposed to have done it, but it took them about two years to appropriate the money when they renovated Santa Cruz. And by that time, her eyesight was not very good. This was in 1981 or so. And so I ended up doing the whole uh, altar piece. Right. And I signed it, and uh, Father gave it back, asked Mary Louise if he knew the individual who had done that piece, and I have it, and I'm, I'm thinking of donating it to the Smithsonian, because I think that Santa Cruz has a tremendous history in itself with our ancestors. So you have uh, been exposed to different cultures, different ways of living, the people from the valley, the people from the Salamis, and now moving to a big city. The beauty of all uh, that. You can appreciate the yes. beauty of that all. Yes, and I have, this is something that I've instilled in my children. I have, uh, we have four children, and I've always let them know. Sometimes they'd say, oh, there goes mom again with her stories about, how she had to walk to Santa Cruz and cross that river. <laughs> and there's stories in that book regarding my childhood. There's a chapter on my mother and a chapter on myself. And, and uh, like I say, the beauty of it. Midway towards this book, uh, Nancy said to me, well, you know, the instructions for culture are gonna get lost. So I went on my own and constructed uh, a book on culture and I've, I've got the other book there. I gave no Willie. Scan it so, you know, mm -hmm. so all the mechanics and everything are in regard to that. And uh, I printed 500 thinking, I don't even know if I can sell 100 because nobody knew what I, what I was doing. You know, they didn't know what culture was. But it took me about two years and I got, I sold all the 500 the museums and Las Colondrinas, the lady there that's in charge, Mrs. Martin said to me, she said, Esther, she said, this was a book that was long in need. And she said, and it'll be here long after you're gone. So that made me feel very good. My only regret is I wish my mother had been here when I had accomplished all of this because that was their goal was, you know, to preserve the culture and, and to do all of this. So you see, I've been very fortunate to be able to touch more than one world. Do you have any questions? I have one. You mentioned uh, working in supply and property. Uh, does the term witch hazel have any special significance in Los Alamos? Witch I hazel. Know, witch hazel. I can't say that I did come across that. Tr uh, Trinity, I remember Trinity. Um, well, what I was fishing for uh -huh. was um, plutonium. It's a really nasty metal, metallurgically. Uh huh. And so they alloy it with gallium, but they didn't want to give away the uh, game so for a long time, if you wanted to order gallium, you ordered witch hazel. But, and I have no idea what you had to order if you really wanted witch hazel. Uh-huh. 
but but uh, gallium uh, was called witch hazel for uh, uh, as, as, as a kind of a code. Yeah, no, I I can't say that I ever did. By the time that we got our files in regard to any of the supplies of anything, it was more we were more of keepers than we were in regard, you know, like. I would say probably um, um, an inventory type of thing. And of course, there were the higher ups who were responsible to see that whatever it was that was in need. But I don't think I ever dealt into uh, looking up or whatever that the supplies were. Uh, in regard to that. We were in a secure area and everything, we had a guard, uh, we had to have passes in order to get through there. Um, but even with all of this, you know, I think the impact of, of the war and what we were into was not something that we necessarily dwelt into. I don't know for you, but but you know, we had a job. We were lucky to have a job, and we took mm -hmm. care of it, and they took care of us. Because well, our ancestors went through a lot. They were impressed by the depression. A lot. And we, we had a job. We took. We there was a gentleman, sure right? Took care of your job. Exactly, and there was a gentleman by the name of. Um, he lived in San Pedro, and I remember, uh, and he worked in our department. I can't think of his name now. But he got a lot of jobs for a lot of the people in the valley up in supply and property. Um, the greater percentage of all the people spoke no English and they had no training in any of the items that they had. This the, was... The fellow you're talking about from San Pedro is Clyde Green. Yeah. Cl there you go, Clyde Reed. It was Clyde Reed. He lived in the lower part of Valley over there by the San Pedro area near the chapel, in the near the chapel. Um, so it's it's been a very fascinating life for me. I'm very thankful that I was born late in life to my mother because my sister was 11 years older, and so was my. My brother was nine years older. And all my first cousins were all older than I was. But I was lucky to experience uh, Los Alamos, which is something that my older brother and sister were not able to. Is there anything that was particularly funny that you might want to share with us, uh, either with the family, with Los Alamos, with the area? I don't know, I guess I was pretty independent and pretty serious since I was, since I was little. Um, one of the things that comes to my mind in regard to at home, not necessarily in Los Alamos, but when I was little, I guess I was very close to my father since my mother was working. And I remember during harvest of chili, he would go down to the orchard and he'd, and down to the, where the chili was and he'd say, okay, he says, I'm gonna check and see if the chili's ready or not. And he said, now the first one that cries means that the chili's ready because it's hot. But what was so funny, and I never thought about it before, but he would cut off the tip of it, which basically has no veins, and he would let me eat that part, <laughs> you know? And I think to myself, you know, that was his way of just introducing me. Well, part of our culture, and I think kind of a testing, but like I say, I was very independent since I was very little. I wanted to help with, you know, whether to even drive the tractor from here to there when they were pitching the hay or doing something or, or doing the irrigating. Um, 
something that wasn't so funny. I remember one time my brother and I went down to the, where all the watermelons were. My brother decided that he was going to, you know, cut into the watermelon and see if it was ripe or not. And then he'd plug them right back and turn them upside down. Well, needless to say, <laughs> we really got in trouble. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Um, another thing that you wonder if maybe childhood, you, you think of things so much greater. I can remember that we would go out and clear six inches of snow, we still had enough in order to be able to make ice cream. Now, whether it was the fact that I was small and it seemed like, but it seemed like that there was a lot more snow in those days than there ever was now. I knew, um, I guess I knew the severity of the need of water because my dad was a farmer. So, many things that happened were basically more serious and I think made me more independent, especially since my mother was at work. I would try to fill in for her at home, even as a child. Um, this wasn't funny, but I remember one time trying to can for her and I got to the point where I sterilized all the jars and everything and I went to put them in that um, pressure cooker and I was so afraid that thing was going to explode on me. I don't know how old I was. I must have been young, but I was terrified. I just got that far and I thought, well, my mother will have to put them in that pressure cooker because I knew it was going to explode if I had done it. <laughs> but, um, we, we all grew up on small farms here. Yeah. That was just a way of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, uh, we had so much, uh, something that I often say, and I have to laugh now with the recession as it is, I think I was born in 33, and of course the depression was in 30. But in all the years that I was born, and I know for my sisters and my brothers, we felt rich because we had meat, we had fruit, we had vegetables, we had everything. We had no mother money in the stock, uh, brokers, so we didn't care if it, you know, it went kaput because we had no money, but we never suffered any of this because of the fact my dad was a very good farmer and provided us with everything, milk, eggs, uh, pork, beef, like I say, fruit and vegetables. Uh, I loved to go out early in the spring with my salt shaker and eat little green apples and radishes. Uh, these are joys that my children would never ever experience. It was, uh, we were pretty mature in comparison. I tell my grandchildren now, you're spoiled. We, uh, we used to, they, my kids used to fight about who had to do dishes, and that meant putting them in the dishwasher. Whereas Joseph and I had to go down two ditches the into water. the pump to draw the water and bring it back up to the house. So you see, times have changed tremendously, but the children are spoiled now. Well, you now, appreciate the good times. You, I appreciate that very much, but believe me, when it, the bucket was running empty, or it was time to take a bath, or it was time to wash, everybody was disappearing because they didn't want to go down <laughs> to have to carry all those buckets of water. And, and that was because my dad had tried putting a well in the upper section. See, we, we lived in a, in a hill area. The property was all down below, and we lived in a hill area, and when the, he was drilling for water, they charge him according to the foot, and since you were in the hill area, it, he had to go quite deep in order to get any water. 
because I understand the first one when I was elated when I saw water coming out, but they said that's not drinkable water. You know, they had to go further down. So our first well was down in the lower part of of the of the ditch, the second ditch, the irrigation ditches. And uh, like I say, I I feel very fortunate in having lived in in both worlds, and I think I appreciate a lot more, you know, what we have and what we do, um, because of the fact that I did see, even if it was a small portion of that. Uh, it had a lot to do with, with my upbringing.